Welcome to None Dare Call It Ordinary, the podcast that digs into the unusual, unorthodox, and downright unsettling beliefs found in the depths of the internet and the heights of paranoia. I'm your host, Dylan, and with me is the sacred and sassy Brent. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Sacred and sassy. Best combo there is. That is the best combo, yeah. <laughs> you can be sacred, but you better be sassy, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, rub it in your face, your sainthood. Rub it in everybody's face. So firstly, uh, we do have a minor update on the Russia investigation, not even oh, what yeah, we're talking about true. anymore. Yeah, so Richard Nixon enthusiast and well-known Batman villain, the skinny penguin, Roger Stone, was arrested <laughs> Friday by federal agents. You know, I, I think that's a little false. He's not that skinny. That's true. He actually isn't skinny. He's I mean, relative ripped. to the penguin, I, I could see yeah. that, but it's relative. I think we should just put yes. that out there. <laughs> So yeah, that there's that. And also I, w- I was, before we were, you know, started recording, I was listening to the Novus Orta Watch, the Tradcast podcast. Oh, Tradcast. That's, um, that's right, Tradcast. Um, it's, you know, it's a good podcast. I was listening to it. It's about how the new Bible of friendship, this is the one episode I was listening to that Pope Francis wrote the foreword in. Quote, unquote. So already bad. Yeah, quote, unquote, exactly. Yeah, the host is like livid. He's like pissed at this silly new Bible, uh, condemning anti-Judaism and admission uh, by the fake Pope, but the Catholics have sub- subjugated Jews for 19 centuries and so forth. Man, so that's most of the centuries. Things. <laughs> that's a lot of centuries. So anyway, that's a sun Funday morning uh, listen that I don't really uh, recommend at all to anybody. But anyway, what are we uh, what are we talking about today? Uh, so today we're continuing our Sede Vacantism series, and we're going off on a little little bit of a side quest in the uh, Sede Vacantism world. You know, our first three episodes kind of laid out the Godfather, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, and the SSP-10, or we've been saying SSPX, I'm just going to keep going with that, and how yeah. the nine, quote unquote, broke off and formed the SSPV, and then you got Archbishop Took just consecrating everybody, <laughs> and how, you know, that leads us, that there's a whole kind of train there. There's a whole kind of lineage there of Sede Vacantists. But today we're going to be talking about a gentleman, the quote unquote, maybe Bishop Francis Schuchert, who he kind of took the Sede Vacantis thing in the more cult direction, oh, I would nice. say. I mean, I think the other Sede Vacantists were trying to, you know, keep the basic Catholic Church kind of stuff going. Yeah. But Francis Schuchert, he uh, he went wild with it. I'm just <laughs> going to say that. And I think, uh, Brent, you have some information about the beginnings of one young Francis Schuchert. Yes, I do. So, Schuchert was born in July 10th, 1937, in Seattle, Washington. So, he got his bachelor's degree at Seattle University in 1959. I was trying to find out what he majored in. Yeah. I saw both said he got education and something else. Some said linguistics. Some said language arts. Yeah, I'm going to go with last things, maybe. Last things. Last things. I think that makes a lot of sense. (laughs) Because language arts is always, to me, that sounds like that's... That's like an elementary school <laughs> type of thing that they yes. call it. Instead of calling it English or calling it literature, they call it language arts. Yeah, he got his degree in cursive, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. So anyway, he enrolled in pre-seminary afterwards, but dropped out due to typhoid fever. This would sadly be a recurring theme for him. Yeah, this guy, he got sick a lot. And it's going to be kind of a big catalyst for the direction he took in life. Instead, he began teaching high school in Seattle and worked as a linguistic research analyst. And this kind of gives, this makes it look like maybe he did get a linguistics degree instead of just language arts, whatever really that means. So he joined the Blue Army of Our Lady of Fatima in 1958. So basically, they were all about some apparitions of the Virgin Mary some kids saw in Portugal. Yeah, and that's it's a Fatima Portugal specifically. Oh, Fatima is Portugal, uh, yeah. which is why which is why it's called this. And that makes sense. They told these kids some things, and th- that's actually an interesting subject in its own right. So in 1961, he got typhoid and an eight day coma. So he attributes quote tremendous recovery to Virgin Mary. You know, meanwhile Jesus is like, "Hey, what about me, huh?" No, no. See, those kids I mean, didn't Jesus. see Jesus. They saw the Virgin That's Mary. That's true. That's and he true. was also really into the Virgin Mary, so it's kind of like, well, right. I mean, it's just obvious. Maybe yeah. not focusing enough on the Lord. I'm just going to say that, but you know, <laughs> hey, whatever works. So in 1963, Schurker contacted thromboflobitis of the legs mm. so not good not good what is that by the way so it's according according to the mayo clinic it is an inflammatory process that causes a blood clot to form and block one or more veins usually in your legs which sounds yeah, rough like, not good 
So he said he would use his legs to walk and preach about the Virgin Mary. If he got better, he did, and he did. He kept to his word. I mean, that's good. Yeah, that's a good thing. He became famous as a charismatic speaker for the Blue Army and was elected to council in 1963 at the age of 26. Yeah, he was really famous. I I was able to find a lot of newspaper clippings advertising his, his talks and whatnot. This is where he really turned to working with them. Um, But then he gets some other ideas. So sometime between 1963 and 1967, Schuchert left the Blue Army and formed the Congregation of Mary Immaculate Queen, otherwise known as CMRI. And Latin is Congregio Marie Regina Immaculate. They were also called the Fatima Crusaders. He also founded the Tridentine Latin Rite Catholic Church. Dude, we should actually start our own set of a contest podcast called The Last Podcast on the Right. Oh, <laughs> oh I think, by the way. I think we would run into some copyright issues with that uh, we one. We may. Um, Sorry, guys. Also, my understanding Perfect. about the difference is that the um, the Fatima Crusaders or the CMRI, that's kind of the religious order yeah. part of this. So this is like the Franciscans or the Dominicans kind of side of it. Mm-hmm where the um, the Tridentine Latin Rite Catholic Church is actually the church part of it. Oh, okay. It's where you or I would go if we decided right, right. to um, renounce our modernist worldly ways. I'm not ready yet, but... One day, one day. Oh, yeah, maybe. Maybe next week. So Sugar and associate and future enemy, Dennis Chicoin, began lecturing on sedevacantism, getting the ire of the Catholic Church, but also attracting some Jesuits and diocesan priests to get access to the sacraments and the mass. So, and again, you got to have it. You got to. You got to have that apostolic succession. You got to. <laughs> we can't just do that. You know, <laughs> like like let's say right now, Brent, let's start a set of a contest church. Already on it. We can't do it. We got to have the we got to have the you know, the folks on top. Yeah, that's right. So in 1969, Daniel Q. Brown is consecrated in the quote old Catholic line, thinking that Roman Catholics didn't have valid orders while the old Catholics did. I really would prefer if I called this, I guess I should start calling it the ye old Catholic line just for some old timey, <laughs> old timey. And that um, makes sense because the uh, the old Catholic church in a way is kind of, they're the set of contests for Vatican I. Oh yeah. Um, because Vatican <laughs> I in 1870-ish was when uh, papal infallibility became a thing and they right. didn't like that at all. And so they kind of broke away. I don't know if they said there wasn't a pope, but again, they kind of, it's another Vatican council that they didn't like. Right. And so you have this other line of of bishops and, you know, Daniel Q. Brown and a lot of city of a contest kind of jump on that. Yeah. And I think the only really real answer we can have is just stop doing councils. Uh, um, just stop counseling <laughs> to stop doing them. They all thought together. they would, they thought with, well, we got papal infallibility, <laughs> just listen to the pope and then we're done. No more councils, but you know. <laughs> You can't oh, please man. everybody. That's true. So shortly after consecration, he went back to calling himself a Roman Catholic and broke off ties with the old Catholics. And yeah, this is the uh, a recurring theme in the <laughs> Seti Facontist world of, uh, again, it's like tenure. You know, once you get yeah. it, you can just yeah. say, eh, too bad, I can do what I want. <laughs> so Brown joined up with Schuchert and insisted he consecrate him. Hey, hey, now that's forcible consecration. When you're a consecrator, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the crucifix. I've heard. <laughs> oh, that, man, never heard. <laughs> so once Brown broke ties with the old Catholics, Schuchert accepted. Yeah, because he wasn't. He didn't want anything to do with those old Catholics. It's like, no, I'm a Roman Catholic. We're doing it legit. That's right. Because the Roman Catholics wanted nothing to do with him, he was consecrated in a rented ballroom in Chicago in 1971. And I mean, I think that's what Jesus would have done. Yes. <laughs> you know, he's not doing it the official way. Of course, since this was without pontifical mandate, that means both Brown and Sugar would automatically be excommunicated. Nice. So they signed up for auto excon. Less hassle and only $99 and 99 cents a month. What? That's too much. Yeah. I, well, I think you get, um, cause that's what it costs normally to get excommunicated. But if you sign up for the automatic excommunication, oh, right. they knock off $2 off that bill. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that's a year, not a month too. I mean, I'm not being ridiculous. So Trads would argue that this ain't so because of necessity or, or whatever. Yeah. Again, this is, this is the back and forth argument. Like, look, um, bishops can be consecrated without papal approval in times of necessity. And then it just becomes a legal argument. 
Once again, shortly after Brown broke off ties with Schuchert, in a letter in 1973, Brown said, Your group has become a personal cult of Francis Schuchert and cannot call itself Catholic. Yeah, I, it's great. And again, I mean, this is like four years. This is like two flip flops <laughs> in four years. This brown guy, who knows what he's up to? What are you, John Kerry? All right. Um, oh, oh, man. Bring it back. Yeah, go joke. play some hockey. Prove you're a man. <laughs> go sailing on your sailboat and eat yeah, your ketchup. What a French guy that guy was. So once Schuchert is, he becomes a bishop, or at least he thinks he's a bishop. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, we don't want to argue that point here. We're That's not true. canon yeah. lawyers. We're not here. Yeah. Um, this is when the um, the Tridentine Latin Rite Catholic Church really starts to pick up steam. Between 74 and 79, Schuchert ordained Ciccone and five others to the priesthood and started the Tridentine Latin Rite Catholic Church in 1978. The good days. Good 1977. Days. The Jimmy Carter <laughs> days. <laughs> yeah. So somewhere around 1977, he purchased 730. 35 acre Jesuit seminary called Mount St. Michael, just north of Spokane, Washington. And this is really a sign of the future Pope to come, I think. I think this is a sign here, but you're going to have to wait for the next episode (laughs) to find out that truth. (laughs) Yes. They grew to the point of being able to send priests abroad to Canada, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, and the Holy Land, which is obviously Kansas. Um, Just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're not there yet either. That's next Again, episode. Again, spoilers, right, um, <laughs> spoilers. Whoa, God whoa. Damn it. <laughs> whoa. According to them, by 1981, the group had about 120 sisters, six active priests, 61 clerics and brothers, a K-12 through grade boys and girls school, and a variety of organizations for the church, including a convent for the mentally and neurologically impaired and a guild to aid the elderly and terminally ill. They had a basketball team and a soccer team actually speaking. Actually, that's not true. So, you know, I, I, I have, that's not right. Anywho. So the same publication stated that running the church would be enough for a strong bishop, let alone one who, quote, is so physically ill, maliciously slandered and persecuted, betrayed at every turn, exhausted with work and his uh, solicitude for his flock. Yeah. So very humble. Uh, Sugard is very humble and is not paranoid. <laughs> Not at all. He's not worried what other people think about him. That's right. (laughs) He's just perfectly happy and dandy. So in addition to Mount St. Michael, they also owned over 18 other properties collectively worth about $8 million. That's pretty good for, you know, like a decade's worth of work, give or take, or, you know, even half a decade. And speaking of those slanders and persecutions, you know, like all the Sede Vacantis, they run into some pushback. Mm-hmm. For example, Bishop Lawrence Welsh of the Spokane Diocese said of Schuchert, quote, Bishop Schuchert has received no mission from the Church Universal and does not accept the unity of the apostolic office. Yet these are some of the very elements which make the Church Roman Catholic. In another section, Bishop Welsh adds, quote, They deny the teaching authority of the Second Vatican Council and the last four popes. Implicitly, Bishop Schuchert has set himself up as the final and last arbiter of Catholic tradition. Humble. Humble. He's the humblest man who's <laughs> ever one lived. Yep. Um, we all know that the last arbiter of Catholic tradition is the recently consecrated Bishop Lewis. Yes. Uh, who is, um, he has blessed our podcast episode. Yes. Um, and I will, with my dying breath, defend the Took consecrations. <laughs> no one's taken that away from Lewis. Which, if I'm wrong, wasn't he kind of, ju- he just didn't see it coming. Took came in and just consecrated Yeah, he him. just did it. He um, had no idea. He was just, he was in a burrow. <laughs> right. In um, the blankets of our bed and just Took just waltzed in this house. Wow. Boom, wham, bam. Classic Took. Like very, it's like Mission Impossible style. In there, out. Boom, gone. Took yeah, been I here. think he he might have come from the ceiling, like you know, like carved a hole and like you know descended in and then just left. It's they got a whole show going on. Yeah. It's quite impressive. In a Spokesman Review article, Schuchert is quoted as having an inter- interesting read on French history. Quote: Some of our teachers studying the French Revolution saw the origins of the red, white, and blue, which was adopted then. The red represented the thousands of bishops and priests who were nailed to the church doors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sus. that's pretty rough. Also, the TLRCC, they had some weird rules. So let's uh, go through some of these here. A little different than your traditional Catholic church. Um, excuse me, your traditional Novus Ordo okay, church. Thank you. Sorry, I, you know. 
<laughs> not enough sleep, but not enough coffee. <laughs> the dress code for women was modest. Women were required to have long dresses and counsel to keep their heads covered at all times. And if you need a habit to cover your head, ladies, I can get you a great deal at Resale Habits R Us. We buy back return habits. In fact, we have a hot sale on our Mary Susan Grieve habit for only $9.99. That's where it went. Man, the Resale Habits R Us are stealing habits. You get a coupon if you bring it in. It's like savers. Schuchert also believed that smoking was a gravely sinful vice. Yeah, even e-cigarettes? You may be fucked. Oh, uh, I I don't, he didn't know about them. That's true. And, you know, it's not smoke, you know, it's a vapor or whatever. That's so true. I think I'm in That's the clear. Right, I'm vapor. gonna work with that loophole. Um, <laughs> which I think would, I think they would approve of. Seti Vacantis love a loophole. Yes. So you can't smoke uh, before mass. And also you cannot sit with your husband because men and women were segregated at church functions. Ah, as it should be. I guess. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe. Some people say. There's, this is also a good one. There was an expectation that members would walk backwards out of church. <laughs> And if you moonwalk out of church, you get to skip confession that week. Ooh, so that's a nice, that's a nice little perk. <laughs> automatic. You, really you cool get the watch, automatic actually. absolution, yeah. I guess. <laughs> it's kind of it's funny because it's kind of like a hostage situation or like a like a standoff situation where you gotta back away, <laughs> yeah, you know, in a totally. duel or something. That's kind of the you gotta <laughs> keep your eye on the Eucharist. <laughs> There was a requirement that children attend only the church's schools. Yep, been there, done that, sadly. Yep, you know all about that, and look how look how well it worked for you. Exactly. But what about after, you know, primary school? Well, students were rarely granted permission to attend college since none existed that Shuker considered as being Catholic. And there was also a restriction on television programming and censorship of reading material. Did my dad write these rules? I don't, it's very interesting. Yeah, just all the, you know, all the, the naughty words were just cut out. <laughs> yeah. I think that was the main, the main thing. <laughs> and there was also the prohibition of dating until the students were out of high school. Huh. And those interested in marriage had to attend the canna cell and were required to follow established rules and guidelines regarding courtship. I'm not really, do you know what the canna cell is? Nope. Yeah, I just don't, I am not sure what that is, yeah. um, the canna cell, I don't know. I hope it's not like a jail cell. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a cell phone, right. um, so I don't know. If if any of our listeners know what that is, uh, we would be, we would like to know. We want to educate everyone, including ourselves. But, you know, Shukert, he wasn't going to take this persecution lying down. He had some responses to all this, especially Good. all these rules. Nice. So he said the dress code, it was by traditional standards, and it was strict, but the dress code was not based upon traditionalist standards, but upon compliance with the standards set forth by Pope Pius XI and Pope Pius XII regarding, quote, Mary-like standards of modesty. I don't know. I see I see a loophole here, though. You know, I, I'm identifying one here. You could dress the way you want, ladies, and when confronted, say, duh, I'm wearing a Mary-like standard clothing. Mary Magdalene! Boom! Oh! Wrong Mary, bitches. Oh, oh, wrong Mary. Yeah. And I'm sure she was dressing modest. Yeah, no, Let's not much... <laughs> besmirch her name. <laughs> Let's not. I'm not going to engage in the... Uh, you know, the slandering of sex mm -hmm. workers here on this podcast. Right. The Mary Magdalene shaming. Yeah, no, yeah. we're not doing that. Good. Representatives of the TLRCC also asserted that women were not required to cover their heads except when in church. I would have just worn a ski mask. Screw it. I mean, that just gets the face, though. You got to get the, the back of the head, too. <laughs> so maybe like a ski mask and... I actually admit, like I, I meant a, not a ski mask. What are those called with like the knitted masks that bank robbers use? Oh, <laughs> is that a, a balaclava? Maybe that is a ski mask. You're thinking of a hockey mask. Oh, maybe <laughs> I am. Oh, I think you're right. Yeah, a balaclava. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're right. You're right, I'm wrong. <laughs> but anyway, so they, however, they were encouraged to have them covered whenever in public in imitation of the Virgin Mary, whom tradition tells us always had her head covered in public. Mary all, always covered her head, that is true, but what is rarely reported in the traditionalist teaching is that she wore very skimpy clothing, so it was sort of a wash. I don't know if that's true. Um, you're right. It's not. <laughs> uh, it's not even really a joke, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a weird, like a weird, like, let's just focus on yeah, the head covering. Right. <laughs> they also, they accept men and women indeed were obliged to occupy the opposite sides while in church. That's true. <laughs> hashtag occupy the opposite sides while in church. That's a bit long for hashtag. We'll work on it. it. It's we'll a much. I don't know if it's even allowed. But, anyway, but this custom goes back to the earliest days of the Catholic Church and was taught by the fathers of the church. St. Augustine <laughs> roundly condemned those who would criticize this practice. 
Bishop Schuker did teach that smoking was against the fifth commandment. We all know that Rome doesn't issue decrees on every moral matter. Rome has not issued a decree against the use of heroin or LSD, but that does not absolve the local bishops and clergy from condemning the use of it. You need to do like, an, like a beer and loathing in Las Vegas where you go into traditional mass like, whoa. <laughs> See, yeah, to me, that's a lot more terrifying than like walking yeah, through the circus circus. Absolutely horrible. Yeah. Getting some magic <laughs> mushrooms and having to go to mass. <laughs> My God. And what about that walking backwards thing? So the practice of walking backwards out of the church, it was optional, not mandatory. You know, oh, we're not, good. this isn't, we're not a totalitarian organization. <laughs> um, it was encouraged, however, in an effort to keep the ideals outlined by Pope Pius XI on the kingship of Christ. It should also be noted, we've kind of, we haven't mentioned Pius XI very much. Oh, yeah. In some ways, he was like the hardcore anti-modernist pope of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. He was really the guy who was like, modernism is bad, bad, bad. And so that's why they're really into him. Just kind of a something to keep in mind. Also about, you know, the issue about college. By forbidding members to attend college without good cause, Schuka asserts that he was conforming to the teachings contained in an encyclical of Pope Pius XI, which states, quote, Catholic children may not attend non-Catholic, neutral, or mixed schools. And it pertains exclusively to the ordinary of the place to decide under what circumstances and with what precautions against the danger of perversion, attendance at such schools may be tolerated. Mm -mm. And lastly, you know, Bishop Schuchert allowed only discerning adults to watch television, and even then only with a great deal of caution. He claims this is in keeping with a statement of Pope Pius XII regarding the evils that television presents to Catholics. Not even Nick at Night. Like, Dick Van Dyke is the fucking devil. Uh, he's the well, worst. That's he, you, obvious. Wonder, wonder why he's still alive? Yeah. Dude's in his 90s, and he's still out, you know, singing and dancing. That's right. I think that's a coincidence. <laughs> all right, so there's all this persecution. There's all this slander. But as always, the real enemy is inside the house. Oh, God. And unfortunately, Ciccone, 2012, <laughs> goes rogue. <laughs> So on June 3rd, 1984... Oh, just two days prior to my half birthday. Oh, yeah, those half birthdays again. <laughs> um, Ciccone spoke out against Schuchert from the pulpit. Uh -oh. The charges were reported in the Spokesman Review. Quote, After we reobtained possession of the priory and started to go through the boxes of mail that had been accumulated over the years and simply stacked in corners, we found a large amount of cash and over $15,000 in out-of-date, uncashed checks. For wow. the past several years, several things in the community have been in complete and utter chaos. The vast majority of chaos is caused by Bishop Schuchert's inability to physically function due to pain, lack of sleep, and medications. Jesus. Chaconi has also charged that Schuchert was sexually involved with some of his male assistants. He said he has several sworn statements. Quote, I have in my possession sworn statements by several persons whom Bishop Schuchert told personally that he was the Pope. Oh, shit. These persons were told not to tell myself or other priests and clerics since we do not have the grace to accept it. So shortly after these allegations were made public, Ciccone left his mansion, just skedaddled right <laughs> out of there. And the story is kind of is kind of bizarre. And he kind of after he left, he made the statement that, quote, if there is some way I can just let the people know we didn't run away, we were sent away, we were thrown out of our home. If there was any way we could have stayed there, we would have. Mm -hmm. They must know that it made it was made impossible. But that might not be right. Apparently, they only thought they had to go. So here's <laughs> what happened. So on June seventh, nineteen eighty four. So this is a couple of days after um, his you know speech at the pulpit. Ciccone filed a lawsuit to prohibit Schuchert and ten associates to return to the seminary or the mansion. Papers were served at the mansion as a result. Mm, Schuchert misread the papers and thought they were an eviction notice. <laughs> and he also thought there was a warrant out for his arrest for some reason. I, I was reminded watching Real Time with Bomara this weekend. And uh, Dan Savage was talking about the story where one of the aides wrote it where Trump ate a piece of paper really fast when they came. someone came into the room. Yeah, Just I heard devoured. about that. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> Yeah, and that should have been Schuchert's strategy. Yeah, just exactly. eat that, just eat that summons, it, and then it doesn't exist. <laughs> and so there was a clarification from Ciccone's attorney, Bruce Erickson. He said, quote, there wasn't any warrant out for his arrest. I or the court or the sheriff's department can't force them to read the documents. 
Uh, yes, you can actually. I just, I mean, I'm just picturing Clockwork Orange scene here. Oh, <laughs> you just trap his <laughs> eyes open. <laughs> Look, you're not being evicted. You're just being sued. <laughs> there's a whole legal process here, buddy. <laughs> and so, you know, there's all now they got all these allegations. Chaconi has gone from friend to frenemy and is quickly just, you know, scooting onto enemy territory. So how is he going to respond? So regarding the charges of sexual impropriety, the spokesman review of August 26, 1984, quotes Bishop Shugart saying, quote, Shugart denied the allegations. He said the charges are part of a plot by Ciccone to discredit him and seize control of the church. The charges sicken me because there's not a word of truth to it at all. Oh, boy. Shugart's defenders point out the difficulty of proving a negative. <laughs> How does one prove that an accusation is false when by its very nature it excludes the possibility of either physical evidence or witnesses? Furthermore, it is accepted science that sexual predators are incurable. Therefore, if Bishop Shukert was a sexual predator, as some claim, surely over the last 21 years, at least one more accusation would have surfaced, especially when considering that there have been people who left the Shukert faction between 1984 and 2004 who were very hostile towards him, but no new accusations have surfaced. In 1987, all of the religious men, seminarians, and boys that were boarding with the seminarians were individually questioned by the sheriff's department and the FBI regarding this particular accusation, but nothing of concern was found. Hmm. They further claim that even if the accusations were true, <laughs> were true, even if they were true, the authority given to the church by Christ is not contingent upon the personal sanctity or impeccability of the hierarchy exercising that authority. That's a nice fail safe. That's, That's a terrible great. fail safe. Yes. That's always whenever you have to go, even if it was true territory. <laughs> That's kind of like, okay. That reminds that's, me of you know, something going on right now. Hmm. All right. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy should be some nominated to the Supreme Court, actually. But that's just oh, another man. thought. <laughs> Justice Bishop Shukert. <laughs> so now, regarding Chaconi's allegation that Bishop Shukert was incompetent, neither civil nor ecclesiastical law allows legal actions to be taken against an incompetent person. Since Chaconi's public accusations of incompetency... Bishop Shukert squared off with him in various courts of law in California, Washington, Utah, and even Canada. And they barely oh, have shit. a lot there. <laughs> Never once did Ciccone raise the incompetency issue in any legal proceeding, okay. nor did any court of law ever question the bishop's competence, despite the fact that the bishop took stand in many of these legal actions. <laughs> Apparently not ne legally confident of competence. So No, not no. at all. <laughs> I kind of like that as you can't sue me because you think I'm stupid. I kind of <laughs> like that. The stupid defense is that you think I'm you think I can't do it. So you can't sue me. <laughs> and Schubert also denies that he ever declared himself to be Pope. But in a bizarre twist, the sitting Pope did, however, claim himself to be Schubert, which confused everyone. <laughs> Just, oh, man, that's <laughs> what a imagine? twist. That would be crazy. Pope John Paul II, what are you doing? <laughs> Some of his followers, however, believe him to be so based upon their belief that he is the last true Catholic bishop in the world and upon the teaching of the Catholic Church that the Church must have a pope except during periods of interregnum. Mm -hmm. Regarding Ciccone's allegation of finding large amounts of cash and out-of-date checks, the Spokesman Review quoted Bishop Schuchert as saying, quote, an assistant failed to properly handle the matter and that he was unaware of the problem. Someone needs to cash those checks. That's what I'm concerned about. Yeah, it's, it's someone needs to cash them, and that's not an excuse. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> like, that's a lot of money. <laughs> I just imagine my mom, because my mom hates it when she like writes a check and it doesn't cash right away. And right, she, you right. know she's just looking at her checkbook every <laughs> yeah. day. You're just like, why the won't, ledger. Why yeah, won't you just, cash on. my check? All right, so there's all these allegations. So what's Schuchert's kind of response to Ciccone? Well, the Schuchert faction considers the Ciccone faction in schism. Schismatics unite! Yeah, everyone's schisming everywhere here. Since both Bishop Schuchert and Reverend Ciccone acknowledge no higher church authority than Bishop Schuchert himself, there was no lawful means whereby Reverend Ciccone could depose him and take control of the Tridentine Latin Rite Catholic Church as he did. Ah. Schuchert formally excommunicated Ciccone on June 30th, 1984. In the August 26th Spokesman Review article, Ciccone is quoted as saying, quote, we contend that it is not a valid excommunication. If he is incompetent, which we believe we've proved, then his acts are null and void. Just like those checks right now, unfortunately. I, I don't know. I keep I keep thinking keep thinking about those checks. Yeah, I mean that's important. That's the money you need. I know. All right, so 
you know, there's a lot of heat going on. Mm-hmm. What's Shuker going to do? You know, he's got, there's definitely the Chaconi faction, but there's still the Shukert faction. And so they decide to move to sunny California. Woohoo, with an ache in their heart. Uh, yeah, I think so. Zeppelin, this man. is pretty stressful. <laughs> so following the quote unquote eviction, Shugert and some loyal followers moved to Greenville, California, which is 102 miles northwest of Reno, Nevada. Oh, Ooh. yeah. My Love state. Love that Nevada connection. Yeah. And they took the name the Tridentine Latin Rite Catholic Church, while Chaconi reincorporated as simply Latin Rite Catholic Church. So, you know, Shugert at least gets the full title. That's true. And then, you know, for a couple of years, it was nice and sleepy. But then um, May 9th, 1987... <laughs> The SWAT team paid a Shukert a little <laughs> visit, um, and they found a lot of stuff. So oh, man. they found illegal drugs, precious metals, $75,000 in cash, and eight handguns and rifles. Whoa, Waco style. And of course, I'm referring to Chip and Joanna Gaines' Magnolia Market, not David Koresh and Branch Davidians. So what is get- that? <laughs> you don't know? You don't I know. don't know at all. Yeah, it's Fixer Upper. That's their show. It's um, the Midwest moms love it. My mom loves it. Every mom loves it. Um, your mom is probably too cool to love it, I guess. I don't know. Not that it's oh, bad. It, it's just... If it's a Fixer Upper show, she's probably seen it. She's in it? I okay. Gather. She's into it? Yeah. I bet I bet she would be into it. She yeah. loves that kind so of thing. So they uh, have their, their um, whole... They've taken over Waco, Texas and tried to turn into away from the whole burning of a cult children alive thing and oh man <laughs> turned it into more of a uh, you know sort of like a knick-knack um place with silos repurposed into hipster coffee bars or something i don't know what's going on yeah you know you know what helps you know what helps the burnt out remnants of a cult building tchotchkes all right so shukrit is caught and shukrit he actually he accepts a plea deal he pleads guilty, and all he has to do is a one-day drug diversion class. One day. Um, one day. I don't, you know, I, you know, I mean, not all of that stuff is illegal, except right. for the illegal parts, you know, right. the drug parts. So maybe all the other stuff is kosher. You know, who knows? <laughs> and you know, there was all this kind of legal wrangling between Chaconi and Shukert until about 1993. There was all sorts of lawsuits back and forth. But by 1993, they were all settled with Chaconi really mostly coming out on top. He got the the St. Michael Seminary. He got the the mansion, all that kind of stuff. And so Shukert was kind of left with about 100 followers. And you know, at this somewhere around late 80s or early 90s, Shukert moved his church to Seattle's east side suburbs, uh, mostly so he could be close to his ailing mother. And he actually had two nuns providing her round the clock care. Shugart probably and the church probably kind of would have he would have died in obscurity at this point, if not for one last article in 2002, which kind of made national headlines. And it's pretty rough. It's a pretty rough <laughs> kind of again, I, I, I was kind of surprised to find this, you know, at to, to cap this whole thing off. So on September 1st, 2002, two nuns were praying the rosary on a bike path at midnight. And this was after a day, quote, of selling dolls and religious literature in front of a grocery store for most of the day and into the night. Unfortunately, so these nuns, they um, they were attacked. They were both raped and one was uh, strangled to death with her rosary beads, which is just horrific. I mean, it's a horrific crime. Again, this made, you know, national news. And thankfully, the, the perpetrator was quickly found and arrested. Kind of once that happened, you know, in, in a way, that's kind of the 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 crime aspect of it. You know, that's kind of the, yeah. you know, this horrific crime. They found the criminal. But then like once because that kind of got wrapped up fairly quickly, who perpetrated this, you know, this awful, disgusting crime. But then people started to wonder some things about the story. And again, this isn't victim blaming by any means. It's just there's some kind of weird things about it. So one is the local Catholic Church didn't know who these women were which is strange if they were if they were nuns. And mm-hmm. also, it's like, why are they praying the rosary at midnight? Generally not a night owl group of folks. So it yeah, was like, kind of like, what? Like, this is, like, what is up? Like, it eventually kind of was explained by one Rosemary Offenhauer, who was a former TLRCC member, and she recognized the account, which is, quote, nuns in blue habits selling dolls outside a grocery store during the day, out praying the rosary when others were long asleep. Nuns oblivious to the risks in the world or confident that God would protect them. Hmm. 
And so Offenhauer recognized, oh, these were nuns from the Schuker church. Mm -hmm. And so she contacted reporters to point them towards the TLRCC and Schuker himself. And then this is kind of the last public, you know, recognition of Schuker and his church. So it's the 21st century. What are they up to? Well, mass was held inside the Grange Hall in Renton, which, quote, is as long and narrow as a two-lane bowling alley. Oh, man, the worst kind. Yeah, so not the height of opulence, really. <laughs> the church uses a, po a P.O. box for correspondence and has no published phone number. <laughs> um, they were still really big into the Virgin Mary, as you Obviously. can imagine, and yep. it showed in the decor, which was, quote, <laughs> two lighted fir trees sat beside a statue of the infant Mary lying in a bassinet swathed in pink chiffon. Pink and white drapes surrounded the altar, giving the church the look of a young girl's bedroom. What? The infant Mary. I don't think I've ever heard that. I've never heard that yeah, either. Yeah, that's interesting. The baby Jesus, but not baby Mary. Definitely baby Jesus, baby Mary. Yeah. I don't... Huh. Very interesting. Yeah, and um, at least one of the church members had a, to put it mildly, interesting take on the murder and rape of a, of a nun. Uh, she said, quote, this is a Mary Gorbett, who was a church member, quote, I would love to have people pray the Holy Rosary. It's so filled with the grace that human beings need. Our Lady gave us the Rosary centuries ago, and it's a spiritual weapon. If the attacks or obtained for people the grace to pray the Rosary, it would be well worth it. Ooh, uh, no, no, I retract my statement. Yeah, I don't think she's right about that, <laughs> no. I'm going to say. Jesus. And then, you know, Schuchert was not the... this. So this article came out in 2002. He tried to get an interview with Schuchert which he didn't do. He did get a church-written biography about Schuchert. <laughs> and there was actually rumors that he was already dead at this point. So it's, oh, kind, really? of an L, it's kind of an L. Ron Hubbard scenario. Huh, that's where interesting. Where there were several years, kind of like the last five years of his life, there were lots of rumors about whether or not he was dead or not. But apparently he was still alive at this point because then Schuchert died in November 5th, 2006. And I think Ciccone himself actually died in the 90s, in the mid-90s or so. And so that is it for maybe Bishop Francis Schuchert. So Brent, what did you learn this episode? What fascinated you about Francis Schuchert? I, I think literally like the last thing we talked about, obviously with the rape and murder is horrible and did not see this. It's, you know, it's very slow going and then boom again, kind of like last episode actually. But I do. Yeah. I also have never even considered the idea of a, of a uh, baby Mary. That's interesting. Yeah, I need to look into that because I, I know there's a lot of a lot of Protestants criticize Catholics for worshiping Mary. Yeah. And so this kind of, I mean, feeds into that, and it's kind of yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, we'll have to maybe try to dig more into that and see what we can find about a baby Mary a going. Baby on. Mary, yeah. That needs, to, yeah. We need to deal with that. Maybe we can re, you know, revamp the um the nar like the manger scenes or what are they called the the uh, nativity scenes that they sell. At yeah, Christmas the nativity. Sometime. Yeah, nativity scenes. And I mean, we yeah, from I mean, sushi if, if, one. So a, if we're yeah, if we're gonna do the sushi <laughs> nativity, we need to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> what baby Mary would uh, represent. Um, so, I mean, they have her dressed in pink and white. So maybe yeah. like a, uh, a tuna sort of, or a salmon. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Pink and white or some sort of like, you know, thin ginger, whatever the ginger you eat. It could be wrapped around. Oh, her. that's true. Yeah. <laughs> pink ginger. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> Lewis <So> agrees. <laughs> and Lewis kind of looks like a salmon sushi. He's got the ginger. <laughs> he's got the cream. <laughs> So what what did you uh, what set out to you in this one? So I mean I think the same in terms yeah. of that the last story because yeah. I mean it's not at all in the Wikipedia page. Yeah, you know because that's kind of where I started and they had a lot of good sources and they pointed to this and just it kind of just came out of nowhere and how they kind of you know if not for this horrible tragedy that went nationwide they might have just kind of just dropped off the map. Yeah, that's true. All the all the backstabbing <laughs> and how quickly it seems to happen. <laughs> And it's funny because it happened, you know, we see it with, with the SSP V2, how quickly that all fragments. I was just going to say, it's like whenever you're seeing it, and you're going to see it in the next episode especially, it's like when these sects kind of break off from the main thing, main, main kind of religion or whatever, it, it sort of instantly fractures almost immediately into something else. <laughs> it's like, what? Like another offshoot goes on i mean the next episode definitely talks about that but that we'll be talking about but yeah it's like it's amazing how quickly how quickly yes. so baby mary baby mary tragic violence and murder and just can't keep an organization together <laughs> for 
whatever reason. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that will be it uh, for this week. Um, let's see here. What do we have to say? So all of our kind of information you can find on our website, and that will be nondarecallitordinary.com. And if you want to uh, talk to us, tell us what we got right. What did we get wrong? Tell us about Baby Mary. Tell us what the canicel is. We want to learn. We want to teach everyone else. And you can send, you know, send us an email. None dare call it ordinary at gmail.com. And with that, we, we are done. done. It's all about the last motherfucker. Town.